to, to, oh, okay, I got that. Now we're really recording. But uh, please take time to, to meet her and to, to see the work that she does, her research, her practice, her writing. Um, it's truly extraordinary and um, incredibly humane. Uh, Julia McMorrow joined our faculty, I think close to a decade ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she is the author of three absolutely gorgeous books, uh, The Architecture Reference Plus Specification Book, uh, Drawing for Architects, Materials, Structures, and Standards. And all of these publications, um, they come with like a level of lucidity about our practice and about our profession uh, that's truly inspiring. I'm also continuously inspired uh, by Julia's embrace of contemporary topics that range in scale and sensibility from the quality and nature of our civic life and infrastructure to questions of code to cultural issues around accessibility for all to musical theater and design for children. And in all of this research and practice, uh, Julia's work illustrates a very deep embrace of relevant cultural questions and the humanizing potential of visual communication. So this approach in many ways, I believe, stands in contrast to more conventional ideas about converting science and performative data into design frameworks. And so, the level of humanity that Julia brings to communication, to representation, ultimately is liberating in its pluralism, which is why we're so excited to have you here as part of this conversation uh, with students um, who are engaging the world, attempting in many cases to understand code, uh, trying to, to make their way through questions of inclusivity and what that might look like. And so without any further ado, to keep it short, I am going to turn it over to you, Julia. And once again, thank you for taking the time to, to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Anya. That was incredibly um, sweet um, and inspiring. <laughs> now I have to live up to something. Um, but thank you also to Anya and Jacob for inviting me here today and uh, for everyone else for being here. Um, I'm excited to uh, share this work with you. And let me just go ahead and share my screen first. And I'll ask the question, can you see this? Excellent. Yes. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm, pr I'm presenting on the topic of access today. Um, and I've sort of titled this uh, talk, Gaining Access, uh, because I'd like to focus on, oops, not going forward here. I'd like to focus on the many different issues uh, that contribute to designing for accessibility and inclusion, which is something that Anya has already alluded to in my work. Um, and so one of the really most important things about my work, my research, my design work, my teaching as it has evolved, um, is to really look at how to make the built environment um, more accessible, but also teach and make the topic of accessibility more accessible and inviting. Um, and so, oops, sorry. And to do that, uh, to basically sort of move the focus away from the resignation and avoidance of the topic that I personally experienced uh, in the early years of my, um, in the world of practice and shift uh, actively into increasingly productive realms of possibility and potential. Um, so what does access or accessible mean? I like to use that the, I sort of find that these two definitions sum it up and boil it down uh, in a really productive way for me. And they show that we as architects have, are, are sort of always asked to be active in ensuring that what we create is in all possible ways approachable by everyone. And I think friendly is just as important uh, a term as able to, uh, being able to be reached or entered. As with many things, it can be useful to look for something's absence in order to better understand its potential or its presence. For example, this is pretty clearly a case where 90% that does kind of work cannot make up for the rest that doesn't. A little bit accessible is basically the same as not accessible. In working with accessibility, it's often the case that we have to think in ways that we might not be used to and keep thinking that way until we are used to it. So at first glance, this looks like a legitimately accessible parking space, and it was. 
until others, whether unthinkingly or deliberately, negated its ability to serve its intended users. And so regardless of whether the intention was one of personal convenience or hostility, it doesn't matter, the end result is the same. So I think in our looking um, at inclusive environments, we have to always be sort of aware of what messages are being sent about accessibility and whether or not they actually are inclusive. Once you begin to look, you will not be able to unsee or unknow what the challenges are. U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth, who lost both legs in Iraq, has discussed how for most of her adult life, she did not, quote, think about these things. These things she refers to are the multiple barriers to accessibility that are unnoticed by most of society. But now for her, seemingly minor impediments can determine if she's able to get where she needs to go and do what she needs to do. In teaching accessibility, my fundamental ambition is not rote memorization of the ADA or other regulations, but enough awareness of the world around in order to think about these things. In the building trades, we have rules, laws, and codes that provide mechanisms for meeting appropriate legal standards. This one, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is a US law that recently turned 31 years old. I will confess that when I first began working as an architect, which was not long after the passing of the ADA, I had absolutely no idea what it was or how to engage it. And I was mostly led to believe by colleagues and peers that it was an inconvenience to be tolerated. So I'm motivated to illustrate how, for instance, a ramp is much more than a set of dimensional requirements. It is in fact the result of significant struggle like this watershed moment of the 504 sit-in of 1977. This was a peaceful demonstration led by a disabled activist to force the implementation of section Section 504 of the 1973 Re Rehabilitation Act, so an act, um, a law that became law four years earlier. The sit-in took place at the Health Education Welfare, welfare Offices uh, in 10 cities around the country. But in San Francisco, it peacefully persisted for over three weeks. Oops, I need to restart my computer, hold on. Um, in her essay on this historic event, Britta Shute has written, inside the HEW offices, the need for accommodations amplified. Some people required space for walking aids and wheelchairs. Deaf occupiers needed translators. Protesters with paraplegia and quadriplegia needed assistance to lift and turn them when sleeping and sitting. Over the course of so many weeks with rudimentary accommodations inside an office building, protesters compromised their health to achieve their goals. So this was led by disability rights activist, Judy Human, uh, who proclaimed, and I'll read this quote here. Oops, if I can see it. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of separate but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across, across this country is going to continue. It is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally, maybe you begin to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. Um, Judy Human has recently published her memoir, She's Still Living. Um, she's also the subject of this um, amazing Comedy Central Drunk History episode, uh, which I encourage you to check out. I was going to try to play it, but it uh, didn't quite work. Uh, it's very informative um, and entertaining at the same time. So Section 504, for those not familiar with it, basically states that, quote, no otherwise qualified handicapped individual in the United States shall solely by reason of his handicap be excluded from the participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, end quote. So under 504, non-discrimination finally became a legal fundamental right for disabled people. And regulations uh, from it instituted um, sort of made inroads that ultimately led 13 years later to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it was this event that you now see in front of you that finally made that actually happen. So this is from 1990. And I believe that images like these cut more quickly to the point and are less likely to be forgotten than pages of rules. In 1988, two years before these photos, the Americans with Disabilities Act was introduced to the US Congress, was passed in the Senate, but was held up for two years in the House of Representatives. 
until in March 1990, when over a thousand fed up disability rights activists descended on the US Capitol. 60 of them discarded their wheelchairs and crutches to crawl up the 83 steps to the entrance. These disabled citizens were not to be ignored and the Capitol crawl, as it came to be known, is seen as the defining moment that finally forced the passage and then signing of the ADA on July 26 of that year. The Capitol crawl might also be as clear an example as any of the idea that it's sometimes difficult to understand something you don't see and difficult to see something that you don't understand. So even in planning something so seemingly banal as the space around the door to ensure adequate clearance for a wheelchair user, it's difficult to think, it's useful to think less about the rules and more about the possibilities. And while it's helpful to have facts and figures at your fingertips, I recommend it, they can take a long time to study, learn, and digest. I feel it's much more important to first fully grasp why these numbers and dimensions and rules exist in the first place, to then be able to work more effectively with them, and I would say perhaps even toward more innovative ends and even better rule sets even like exactly what is a ramp and how is it spatially different than a flight of stairs, which you can see it's significantly different. But also why things that we might think are small decisions about space, space use impact everyone in specific and different ways. A very recent example is Stephen Hull's Hunters Point Library in Queens, New York. It contains this section on the left of special shelving that is not within accessible routes. For most users of the library, this is not a problem, but for some it is. Even still, the only way to call attention to this lack of accessibility in the building has been through litigation. In other words, even with the ADA and multiple codes in effect, it is still the case, as pointed out by Stephen Zacks, that there is no federal entity that goes around and checks buildings to meet the requirements. It comes from a complaint. In this case, a patron of the library could complain to the Department of Justice and say they don't have equal access and the Department of Justice would come and investigate. In 2021, we should be long past the idea that the responsibility for access lies with those who least likely are least likely to have it and most in need of it. In fact, as far back as 1963, Selwyn Goldsmith's Designing for the Disabled, A New Paradigm, took architecture to task for its complicity in the creation and promotion of disabling situations by pointing out that it is architecture that must make accommodation, not the disabled user's body. He made a very clear distinction between the medical model and the social model of disability. So I wanna uh, consider this issue from another perspective uh, through this uh, very short essay. In 1975, disability activist Victor Finkelstein published this obscure text, and I'd like to read parts of it while also illustrating some of its points. Uh, so I'm gonna quote Finkelstein. In order to make my concept of the social nature of disability more clear, I should like to argue by way of an imaginary example, which turns the world upside down. Let us suppose that 1,000 or more disabled people who were all wheelchair users were placed together in their own village where they had full management and democratic rights. The villager being in a wheelchair is like anyone else in the world of, in the world of people that she or he comes across in his daily life. He sees wheelchair users on television and for all purposes, the able-bodied are people only rarely seen and little understood. One thing the wheelchair user architects quickly discover in this village is that since everyone is always in wheelchairs, there's no need to have the ceilings as nine foot six inches or the door heights at seven foot two inches. And they create their own new standards. Here come their new standards. At last, the buildings are truly in tune with their needs. And let us say that when all the adjustments had been made and become fixed in the wheelchair user society, a few able-bodied people had through no choice of their own to come and settle in this village. Naturally, one of the first things they noticed was the height of the doors and ceilings. They noticed this directly by constantly knocking their heads on the door lintels. Soon, all the able-bodied members of the village were also marked by the dark bruises they carried on their foreheads. Of course, they went to see the village doctors who were naturally also wheelchair users. The wheelchair user doctors said these able-bodied people suffered a malfunction of their functional abilities, which resulted in a handicap. This handicap caused a disadvantage or restriction of activity, which made them disabled in this society. 
Soon special aids were designed by the wheelchair user doctors and associated professions for the able-bodied disabled members of the village. All the able-bodied people were given special toughened helmets and special braces and special braces were designed which gave support while keeping the able-bodied bent at a height similar to their fellow wheelchair user villagers. But one day when the able-bodied were sitting together and discussing their problems, they realized that they were never consulted by the wheelchair users about their problems in this little society. In fact, they realized that there may be solutions to their problems, which had never occurred to the wheelchair users simply because they never looked at the problems in the same way as those who had the problem. End, end of quote. So Finkelstein's text prompted a better fits exercise in my 2018 all access thesis seminar in which students were asked to reimagine a canonical house toward what they saw as a better fit for accessibility. Here you see excerpts from one student's uh, film where he takes on Peter Eisenman's pointedly disorienting House 6, which also in 1975 intentionally confounded inhabitation by even the most robust physical specimens. The comparison of these two are radically different architectural approaches, Finkelstein's and Eisenman's, illustrates that architecture does have considerable agency in this issue, but it's not always easy to see the forest for the trees, especially when dealing with things like codes and rules, which can seem off-putting. But for every rule, it's important to get beyond the what to understand the why. So just a, qu a quick refresher on the letter versus the spirit of the law. The letter of the law, uh, when one obeys the letter of the law, but not the spirit, one is obeying the literal interpretation of the words, the letter, but not necessarily the intent of those who wrote the law. Conversely, when one obeys the spirit of the law, but not the letter, one is doing what the authors of the law intended, though not necessarily adhering to the literal wording. So for example, if you've read through the ADA, you've encountered passages like this. 307.4 vertical clearance. Vertical clearance shall be 80 inches high minimum. Guardrails or other barriers shall be provided where the vertical clearance is less than 80 inches high. The leading edge of such guardrail barrier shall be 27 inches maximum above the finished floor or ground. So first you need to get your head around what that looks like. This is talking about places where the ceiling or overhead system is lower than 80 inches, often happening under uh, an open stair. Therefore, something of the dimensions that you see here in this yellow block must be provided. But then why? Well, because someone who's visually impaired will detect that yellow block with their cane, otherwise uh, they might hit their head. So with an understanding of how much our environment can contribute to or diminish our abilities, we should also see that rules such as the ADA are really just the starting point. There's a lot more to think about and talk about. So I think that architecture school is just one of many places uh, that we should be having that conversation. Um, so running simultaneously with the thesis, um, the thesis studio on access a couple of years ago, I also ran a seminar called Fresh Access All Graphics, where we invoked accessible graphics to assist in the process of providing an exuberant and upside down context for teaching about accessibility. A recurrent theme in our class conversations involved the, real, the realization, which one student expressed really clearly, that we just need to think about this for five minutes to better understand designing for inclusion. Our goal was to produce a book to test out methods to better communicate the spirit of certain ADA rules in hopes of embedding ideas about accessible design early in the education of an architect. The Fresh Access book is not a catalog or recapitulation of ADA rules, but an attempt to make the spirit of such rules more clear and memorable. Ideally, in a wordless and engaging way. So, for example, uh, here's an, uh, the elaborate choreography necessary for a wheelchair user to use a toilet, hence explaining and describing graphically the necessity of the grab bars in certain sizes and locations or why a certain range of heights are best for the most number of users, tall or short, adult or child, standing or in a wheelchair. And from this work also uh, sort of sprang other ways to think about um, access and access to, um, frankly, access to getting out. So an imperative aspect of accessibility is not just how to get into a space, um, but how to ensure people can safely exit dangerous spaces or situations. 
So when we look at the typical codes regarding egress, we understand that there's a system to getting a building's users out to safely, safety as quickly as possible in the event of fire or other danger. And while accessibility is part of this process, I personally think it can be argued that there's a lot more thinking necessary on this topic. So I'd like to go back uh, to 2017 when the Taubman College student-led group Initiative for Inclusive Design invited two disability activists, Mieko Preston and Celeste Adams, to present their lecture, Segregated Spaces. The lecture was impactful and memorable and expressed clear frustration about architecture's inability to meet disability on more productive terms. At the time, Mieko was a student in the MARC program and Celeste was a student in the Stamp School. Their lecture's power came from their ability to speak from experience and research and get right to the point as memorably and efficiently as possible to impress upon everyone why designing for accessibility should never be an afterthought. One of the most lasting impressions I have from that lecture is Celeste describing the powerlessness of being disabled in the event of emergency. Even in the best case scenario where there's a designated area of refuge within a protected exit, shown here uh, in the fire stair, there is still the waiting for help and the likelihood that you will have to abandon your expensive custom-made wheelchair, the thing that gives you mobility once that help arrives. But then consider that in a sprinkler building, a safely separated area of refuge is not even required. The presence of sprinklers allows the whole floor to be considered an area of refuge for a wheelchair user. While this may satisfy code requirements, the letter of the law, the idea of sitting in a wheelchair out in the open while waiting for assistance in an emergency seems cruel and certainly not in the spirit of the law. So such huge gaps in our collective thinking as architects are continual motivators for me. And I'll end with an ongoing project that brings together multiple strands of teaching, research and practice regarding design for accessibility and how the work is trying to amplify thinking for five minutes towards greater and more lasting impact. These are images uh, from the 2019 seminar, Fresh Graphics, Fun and Games, in which we studied games and play as didactic tools for engaging architecture. Among several motivations in the class were to explore the pedagogical advantages of social interaction through game sharing. Games, we learned, are the foil for communication, conversation, and the introduction of ideas. We tested game designs that focused on everything from architectural history to geometry to material costs on very different audiences seen here, including our own faculty, as well as a local class of fourth graders. Ideas from this class became important research for measures of access, a Taubman College Prototyping Tomorrow grant uh, that John McMurrow and I worked on last year within our practice studio app. Our goal was to create pedagogical games and tools for assisting designers in better understanding and designing for accessibility. The research began by studying classic games and then creating the access version of them. So we started with chess. Here are some early studies. And though similar to the ancient game of chess in its use of the same structure, board, pieces, and movement, access chess is about understanding difference in the many ways that people move through and interact with the world around them. Here, players recognize the pieces as representing these differently abled members of society, each moving through the world in a specific way as represented by the standard moves of chess. So just to give a sense, the names of the pieces remain, but the who they are, let's say, has been updated. So the rook with the aid of crutches moves in unobstructed straight lines. The knight's horse is now a wheelchair. With the assistance of a service dog, the bishop moves easily on the diagonal. The king is old and weakened, but he still has power. He relies on a walker and moves slowly one square at a time. The other pieces protect him, but he also has the power to send an opponent back to the start. Note that there is no capturing in access chess, only teamwork. Finally, the queen represents the most able-bodied of the pieces and moves easily in all directions, though with a small child in tow. The objective for each player the, object, the objective of the game is for each player to move safely all of their members of their community across the board while also helping their own king. So the community um, of each player must work together, accommodating, accommodating and celebrating their differences to the ultimate benefit of all. Uh, and in this game, the pawns are assistive devices such as wheelchairs, crutches, canes, or service animals, and they are first acquired before other moves are possible. 
Um, because of the pandemic restrict, restricted our ability to play this game in person with people outside our household, we were compelled to develop an online version as well. Um, and also this travel set, uh, which um, has gone to China with Dan Raishong, one of our collaborators on the project. And um, she's told us that she's played it at least once there. Um, we then looked at the game Shoots and Ladders, um, also a game with ancient origins, whose goal is simply to go from square one at the lower left to square 100 at the upper left, sometimes rising quickly by a ladder or sometimes just as quickly falling down a chute. As simple as this game is, and it is very simple, we saw it as an architectural challenge, especially in reconciling a game about vertical movement that is played horizontally. Our ultimate accessible take on the game was to keep as much of the board as possible and use the vertical mechanisms of movement to form a tower. Here you can see some of these studies. Um, we also um, reimagined this game as stairs and elevators. Um, and like Access Chess, both physical and digital versions were created. Um, and I'm also just gonna say a really boring game, we found out. And what was frustrating about this prototype was having to give into the use of elevators, given the vast vertical distances that needed to be traveled. But we were in, interested in sort of continuing to push into other less obvious territories for accessibility um, that weren't just sort of accepting um, these limitations of vertical travel. So uh, earlier studies actually of shoots and ladders sort of took us away from the shoots and ladders idea. And we realized these were leading uh, to its own game, essentially. Uh, they ultimately led us into the development of an original game, which was our goal all along called Access the Game. Um, so early studies for both chess and shoots and ladders um, kind of led to ideas that reemerged into the design conversations or, for a new sort of set of design goals, but always grappling with the kind of verticality um, both up and down. So access the game is definitely still a work in progress, but I'll share some of uh, the ideas that emerged. Um, one important thing we sort of learned from the earlier studies was that games that were too competitive undermined the ideas of inclusion and vice versa. Uh, so we had to sort of work towards ob objectives of collaboration and togetherness. We established a number of mini games as we called them uh, that sort of just looked at how bodies, uh, in this case, these little figures could move through spaces in different ways. Um, we also had the realization that our work was, our goal was kind of working somewhere in the realm between games, which were usually flat, uh, two-dimensional representations of other things and toys, which are usually more hands-on three-dimensional experiences. And so thinking that these are games um, that could be utilized by students and designers, um, we sort of developed new prototypes for thinking about how to prioritize movement and building and making of spaces, uh, figure out the collective experience and shared opportunity possible. So you see some of these mini games uh, coming, coming into focus. Um, and then within this toy-like building atmosphere to also give attention to how barriers can be reimagined as possibilities. Uh, so if you look on the left, you see the stair is now becoming a portal. Um, and again, like not, not seeing this as necessarily solving all problems, but in opening up questions and, and sort of thinking spatially in a way that maybe we're not used to thinking. So the game continues to develop um, as a place to explore building environments through an informed trial and error approach that studies and cultivates movement and interaction to experiment with taking form and space and making it work better for all bodies. This is a game that we hope will find its way to many situations, um, including classes here at Talbot College. Um, for anyone going into institutions uh, in a couple of weeks, this is something that um, I'd like us to play in different ways, um, but also maybe into less formal environments. Um, so I think I will end there. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share these many different works in progress and to continue to have conversations um, where we can all talk about um, making the built environment more accessible. So I'm gonna end and stop my share. Thank you. Julia, thank you so much. Yay. Um, Happy to take any questions if there. Would you? That would be yes. Thank you. <laughs> while, while people think about their questions and turn on their cameras, I realized that in the introduction, um, I forgot to mention um, that you 
are in a partnership with John McMorrow as principals of Studio Apt. And um, I can't help saying congratulations on your anniversary. <laughs> Thanks, Anya. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that was enough space for people to get their questions together. If anyone has them. Um, maybe as, as people are thinking about questions, one thing that's striking uh, is um, you never use, th there are certain terms that we might anticipate mm -hmm. from questions of access, like you never use the word universal design mm -hmm. or some of the other code words that we hear often associated with questions of mobility, access, and inclusivity. Just wondering if you might mm -hmm. be able to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I I do believe in a goal of universal design for sure, and I, I think I briefly um, flitted across the slide that uh, identified the seven principles of universal design. I think the the challenge is that there are so few things that are universal for everyone, um, and I think that's maybe one of um, yeah, in thinking through like using the game um, as a a struggle for us as designers to sort of like okay. We, when we think we'd have a, a really great solution for one thing or even a way to talk about um, a topic, it, was, it would you know, negate another kind of um, progress. And so I think universal design is an amazing goal, um, but I think there are so many, I think flexibility is a thing maybe that has to be as much a part of thinking as a designer and a creator of spaces in you know, kind of being able to see lots more possibilities, I think, than the things that we anticipate. Or also, you know, I am not myself disabled. And so being open to uh, my own understanding of what could be good for a certain person or a certain body, you know, being way off the mark for somebody else. Um, and so I guess it's not intentional that I didn't use it, uh, didn't say the words universal design, but um, I guess I think it goes like into much more nuanced territory than that. Can I ask a follow up? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm ahead now. Um, maybe I'd, I had a question that is related to what you ended that answer with, Julia, which is just how, how to like work with students to design with the needs of a discriminated group as the priority while not being a member of that group. Um, and, you know, I say this knowing that it's not the job of people of color to fix or to work on white supremacy. It's like mm -hmm. the job of white people and go down the list of sexism or ableism. Like we all need to be working with this, uh, with these goals as our number one uh, priority and focus. But I'm maybe wondering specifically while working with students, like mm -hmm. how do you approach that topic? How do you both think about the needs of certain constituencies, but also make space for them to sort of lead on their own on their own accord, et cetera. The nuances of that territory, I'd be curious to hear more of your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really great question. And um, I think the answer is um, that in a lot of ways, designing for accessibility is very spatial and formal in a lot of ways. So I guess in some ways, easier is not the right word, but in some ways it's maybe easier to show it, um, you know, and, and kind of like, and you know, show it both like through visual means and physical means. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's like everything though, um, the conversations just have to keep going. Like there's no sort of magic bullet. And I, and I think that's where I'm, again, like in my now incredibly long career, when I think back like, oh, you know, when I was a very young baby architect and like, I was told to like ignore, oh, don't worry about the ADA stuff. Or first of all, I'd never even heard of it. And then don't worry about it or, oh, you know, lots of eye rolling, oh, we have to do this thing and, and, to, and accepting that, you know, and so this is a long time ago. Um, yeah, it just got in the way. It got in the way of having a good idea. It got in the way of a really great design and recognizing, you know, once I came to teaching that there is, I mean, obviously there's a platform for talking about these things in a completely different way. And so I think my goal in teaching is that it's kind of the, like, you can't unsee the things you've seen. And so I think and that's why I, I think every time I talk about accessibility, I do honestly 
um, want to acknowledge this, what I, was a really impactful lecture to me was Mieko and Celeste's lecture from now four years ago, um, because it, you know, it wasn't very well attended. I mean, it was attended, but it, it could have been, there could have been more people there. Um, and it really did have an impact on me because I could understand their frustration as they were educating all of us in the audience about uh, these things from both a personal standpoint as, as well as a lot of research they had done on the topic that wasn't specifically related to their experiences. And I just found it incredibly like it has stayed with me all this time. And it really did motivate me to start to bring um, accessibility into first into the institutions course uh, and other things. So I guess I, I think it's incredibly important to reach out and, and be influenced by, um, you know, yeah, the disabled community. And, and I think with social media, there's more and more ways um, to sort of like have those insights into other people's lives, maybe without it being intrusive or demanding. Um, that makes sense. But also playing games. I don't know. I think playing games is a great way to have those conversations. Like truly, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's under the guise of, of togetherness that you're having deeper um, conversations about these things. Yeah, I suppose like one thing too is just being open to getting it wrong. I mean, yeah. it's not, that's a, like you're, it seems like you're both going fully in mm -hmm. while acknowledging your own limitations based mm -hmm. on your experience, but also not being afraid to like of getting it wrong. <laughs> like, I think that's, that's sort of maybe part of, part of the answer sounds like too strong of a word, something we need to be thinking about. Thanks. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think that's uh, when I first did the thesis studio on accessibility a few years ago, I was nervous that nobody would sign up for it because I and we constantly within that class talked about tone and how do we have these conversations that we're not, yeah, we're not being judgmental. <laughs> of you know of anyone trying to sort of like work on this issue and so i think the and that's where the um i think earlier in my professional life of sort of like talk conversations about designing for disability were always a sort of like lamentable like oh this thing we have to do or oh it's such a sad situation which you know it's not i mean it's it's to me it's a really great opportunity as designers we have so much ability to influence how uh, the built environment gets created and used. And that's also where I think that Victor Finkelstein parable, it's just this beautiful little weird text where he's just like, oh, let's just turn this around and you will see it differently. And so that's what I really love is just like completely seeing it upside down and realizing like, oh yeah, that's <laughs> that makes sense when it's put in those terms. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question in the chat, but I have one that's sort of related to what you're, what's being talked about, so I'll ask it first. Um, it, uh, it's about play and games. We had Jose Sanchez last week, who's you know working on games as well, and I'm just curious, like I, the way you're talking about it is like games is an alibi to just sort of talk about mm -hmm. these things and create empathy and community um, and discussion and things. I wonder, like, I don't know, it's maybe like a direct, like basic question, but I'm wondering like how, if and how play and games translates to like our, like building design, or if it's like a thing that exists sort of separate as a discursive mechanism. Um, like what is the role of play mm -hmm. when you're thinking about actually designing, um, you know, like more traditionally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't have an answer except maybe going to Adam's point about like, let's just try stuff. Let's try and see what happens, you know, and, and I'll sort of note, Jacob, you were on a lot of the reviews for the Access uh, Studio, as well as for the, I think you were at the Play, you were at the Play Salon. Yeah, they're all great, salon. by the way. They're so oh, no, good. It was, but it was more them. just to like, you know, I think the the sort of residual effect or whatever is this kind of slow burn exposure to these ideas. And so, you know, the, I don't know, to go to the issue of play and I've 
had a number of classes where we look at toys or games or designing for these kinds of things. The reaction to the games, you know, and we, the students in that seminar were not designing games for accessibility. They were designing games just about architecture in some way. And the reaction to those games that came from the faculty <laughs> was really different from the reaction that they got from a bunch of nine and 10 year olds in both good and bad ways. And so I think it was um, the things that they could anticipate that the games would elicit were always like slightly on and slightly off. And, and so it was sort of, I mean, and again, I think that's definitely part of both the design process and a part of sort of like working with a client, so to speak. Like there's a, it's a give and take and, and you're sort of like designing games for 10 year olds that then, um, you know, <laughs> learned architecture faculty also want to have a say in, like the conversations just get different and weird. And, and to me, the sort of the playful aspect is, you know, there is that also like you're getting, the byproduct is you're maybe learning something, you know, and I, and I don't know that I've represented well enough the access the game because we sort of we've put a pause on that we never we never have we have not sort of culminated our design on that um, thing but a lot of it does have to do with working hands-on and kind of like seeing for yourself things that do and do not work and for at least for that game and the development of it you know as, as we've been working on it we always try to make it about the human figure. And so the, the scale is not an abstraction. It's also something I was trying to allude to with the shoots and ladders prototype where it's not a representation of going up and down, it's an actual going up and down. And so I think the, like, the beautiful thing about a game or a toy is that you can ape reality in certain ways, but also maybe you know take the edge off a little bit by making it um, a kind of more graspable interactive process. That maybe was a little bit roundabout, but I guess it's the, the trial and error aspect of play, I think is quite important because I think that does mimic a design process. Yeah, totally. The shoots and ladders, like bringing shoots and ladders into section uh, was <laughs> just like actually a really interesting thing. And it points to a kind of like, well, what seems to be like a kind of cyclical process of like game to mm -hmm. discourse, to space, to back to game. Like, so I, I, I found that super interesting. Um, okay, so Nick Sheath asks, I like the way you have represented your thoughts and ideas. Curious to know what's the workflow behind those impactful graphics. Um, thank you, Nick Sheath. That's a <laughs> very nice question. Um, the workflow is, um, I guess what I'm just glad that they are impactful. The workflow is, um, when I can't figure out how to express an idea, I make a diagram. Um, and lately those diagrams start to just become little animations. So they're sort of something that's always going on. Um, but I think it, it, does, um, it does find its origin, I guess, in, in this idea that I do think communication of ideas is a key aspect of making things accessible. So if, if it's all obfuscating, um, you know, if an idea, whatever that idea is, whether it's architectural or otherwise, uh, you know, if it can't be sort of, if it can't land with all the people you want it to land with, um, then it, it's just very um, frustrating. So I like to rely on making graphics that um, help me to express myself when I, when I simply can't do it by other means. So they're sort of ongoing. They're always underway, I guess, the graphics. Is that an answer or did you literally want to know like what programs? No, I, I, think, I think that absolutely makes sense. So uh, I just want to get behind uh, the thought process and how you uh, sort of get the ideas through. So that does make sense. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Could I ask a question? Yes. Thank you very much, Julia. I'm always um, both enamored by the quality of the um, the thinking laid out in super tangible terms in total antithesis to me. Um, I'm gonna to try to ask or make an observation maybe. I was, I was thinking about, uh, as you were talking, um, things like Matthew Barney's uh, drawing restraint projects. And um, you may know them where 
he basically produced the, uh, the American artist, Matthew Barney, produces um, obstacles for himself, um, straps himself on the side of a ship or up in the corner of a space to, to increase his um, creative capacities. And he, he likens that to his uh, growing up as an athlete where you would constrain or produce obstacles for your body to increase your athletic capacities. Um, and I guess I started to then think about the creative dimensions of what you're thinking about and what we all, all ought to be thinking about. And I started to think about when you were talking about games, for example, I wondered if there was an interest in other kinds of cultural practices used maybe analogously, as I think you're using games and as Barney, was. I started to think about things like theater and narrative constructions and archeology. span and I wondered if there was an interest. It's piqued my interest. I'm not asking you for you to be interested. It seems like there are a lot of cultural domains that have relational properties like games mm -hmm. that would enable various kinds of audiences to um, participate as, as Adam, I think was richly alluding to, or talking about directly. And I wonder if you've, an interest in, in, in the arsenal, as it were. Oh. I don't mean that in a kind of political or militaristic sense, but <laughs> things you might draw from that, that not you, <laughs> that we, that mm -hmm. I uh, selfishly might draw from with respect to the um, topics, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the critical, absolutely essential issues that you're discussing. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think the, um, I feel a little bit like I've just thrown a bunch of stuff <laughs> out here. Like it's, yeah, there's, there's games and there's accessibility and there's, there's um, toys and narratives. There's all these things. I mean, and I think maybe the lack of mate, like conclusion to any one of those to me, yeah, of course, like opens it up that there's so many different ways, I think, to bring in the kind of game like atmosphere or the experiential or the like learning firsthand. I think there's a lot of uh, those aspects to things. I think this isn't related to necessarily to what you're saying about uh, the Matthew Barney project or referencing, but it does make me think like in the games seminar, you know, we started by looking at each student had to look at an ancient game and a contemporary game and every single ancient game, it was either the, the sort of objective was either military based about conquest, obviously, or agricultural. Like those were the two possibilities, um, which I think is, you know, super fascinating because it reflects um, <laughs> what was going on and, and what priorities and um, necessity was. Um, but I think like, yeah, so to me, it's an interesting, like these allegories of the play, I think are super fascinating. The thing that's, I think the thing that we're still struggling with in the development of Access the Game is the clarity. Um, it's, it's the, we get so far down or so far inside baseball, I think with both um, the game construction as well as the access things that there's this constant like need to like keep pulling it back up into this more legible terrain. And I think like the, yeah, like how do you think about these things that can be like parables or allegories or, or whatever that give you enough depth <laughs> and also allow you to kind of like find it on your own terms, which was why chess was such an interesting um, thing to start with, because of course it's, I don't know, John knows the statistics on this, but there's like exponentially more, like the first the first move, there's only like eight possibilities or whatever, but by, by the second move, it, it becomes exponentially more. And so it's something obviously that can be relatively quickly learned, but then mastering, of course, strategy and things within that, um, is a whole, you know, it can it can have this depth that belies maybe the simplicity of the structure of the game. And is that maybe part of the reason? Sorry, just a quick question mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that shoots and ladders, for example, maybe didn't feel um, interesting or 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 thick or profitable or yeah, or maybe chasing. yeah maybe relationship to chess, for example, right. I think that's true. I think the we were drawn to Sheets and Ladders because it was so different a kind of game 
um, and it did introduce like architectural <laughs> qualities, let's say. Um, but in the end, yeah, it was far more based on chance um, and we couldn't, we struggled a lot with, we were constantly trying to reinvent the game of shoots and ladders, which is what led us to other games, instead of just acknowledging, look, this is shoots and ladders, keep it simple, uh, substitute this with that and, and go vertical. But yeah, I think it, it sort of lacks the, the depth of the narrative is pretty straightforward. I mean, it's still fun to make, still fun to think about that thing, um, but I think the satisfaction of the game that resulted was different. Thank you. Thank you very much for the yeah, talk you. and the answer. Thank you. Julia, as we wrap up this, this conversation, uh, we just wanted to once again thank you for sharing your work and your thoughts and uh, for reminding us to move beyond standards and codes, uh, <laughs> to understand the letter of the law, but to strive to meet the spirit of the law, as you said, um, to question measurements, but to continue measuring. <laughs> Uh, to think about including areas of refuge and to understand refuge from what. <laughs> and also to remind us that regardless of how weighty issues of access and inclusivity are in architecture, that we might continue to approach it with humanity and humor in order to create a baseline for communication. So thank you so much for all of um, those inspiring thoughts and um, enjoy your evening out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anya. That was a beautiful summation. I'm going to have to like transcribe that down. Really beautiful. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, enjoyed spending this time with you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate your yeah. time. See you in person soon, I hope. Yeah, totally. See you soon. <laughs> See you. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.